Good afternoon, everyone. Dear Good afternoon. colleagues, welcome to this virtual symposium, which is organized and supported by Novartis. And the topic of this symposium is updates on B cell therapies and relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. It's my honor to welcome our speaker in this symposium and my friend, Dr. Ahmed Shatila. Dr. Ahmed is well known, he does not need to be introduced. He is consultant neurologist at Sheikh Shakhbout Medical City in Abu Dhabi, and he's a leading expert in the field of multiple sclerosis, and he's the single speaker, and he is the chair of this wonderful forum. So doesn't need more introduction like more than this. And his presentation will be on update on B cell therapies in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. So Dr. Ahmad, please, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jihad, for the kind words. Uh, greeting everyone. Today, I would like to talk about updates in relapsing remitting MS and B cell therapies. This lecture is sponsored by Novartis. As you know, I'm Ahmed Shatil, I'm a neurology consultant, and I currently follow 270 patients with MS at Sheikh Shahboud Medical City. Here are my disclosures. Let's turn on the timer to keep on track of time. So multiple sclerosis. MS is a chronic inflammatory neurodegenerative disease of the CNS, and it's thought to be autoimmune in, in origin. The hallmark of MS is inflammatory demyelinating plaques in the CNS. The common symptoms of MS can vary from person to person, which can include visual problems, spasticity, numbness, tingling, bladder, bowel, or sexual dysfunction. And on a lecture later on today, we will have Dr. Deep K talk about the prodrome of MS, and we'll go into a little bit more information about depression, fatigue, and pain. So stay tuned for his lecture. Epidemiology of MS. It affects about two and a half million people worldwide, and it's one of the most common neurologic disorders, and it's the most common cause of disability in young adults after trauma. It has a higher likelihood to affect women to a man, two to one. The mean age of onset is 31 years of age. It can range from five to 67 years old. My youngest patient with MS is 10 years old and my oldest is 67 at this time. And it's, non and it's less prevalent among the non-white population, but studies have shown that African-Americans, even though it's less likely for them to get MS, their disease tends to be more severe. Etiology and environmental risk factors. It increases in prevalence in the northern latitudes and the southern latitudes. The farther you get from the equator, the higher the prevalence, so such as in the Scandinavian countries. They have more rates of MS than in the Middle Eastern countries, but the rates are increasing in our areas. We're not exactly sure why, but it is. And one theory is that it's really a result of sunlight exposure or low vitamin D. Exposure to cigarette smoke has been associated with an increased risk of developing MS, and it's been linked to worsening progression of the disease. Uh, there has been an infectious etiology hypothesized for years about MS, and it's been shown that MS patients who have been exposed to EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, they have a two to three high, two to three-fold higher likelihood to developing MS. So what exactly is going on for people who have MS? As you can see on the top illustration, you have a normal axon or a normal neuron. You have the cell body, the axons, and the dendritic process. And what happens is signals, actually, instead of going through the entire axon, it tends to jump from node to node to node. And when you have MS, you have inflammation, which actually, which actually strips your axons of the myelin. So now, instead of jumping from node to node, it goes across the whole axon, and it actually reduces the speed of transmission. And with the inflammation, not only does it affect your myelin, it actually can result in transection of the axon and cell death. As I showed yesterday in yesterday's webinar from a slide from Bruce Trapp with axonal transection. Next slide. Remyelination does occur early in the disease, but as the disease goes on with time and you get more scarring, the body's ability to remyelinate these axons become less and less and disability becomes, begins to accumulate. What are the subtypes of MS? There are three main types of MS. Excuse me, just gotta get some water. Three main subtypes of MS. The most common cause of MS subtype and the one where we have the most treatments available is the relapsing remitting form. 
this is in this case what happens is people will usually be fine they get a relapse any symptom they get better from it then time will go by they get another relapse where they worsen then they get better and they kind of yo-yo from relapse to remission over the periods of years to decades but with time usually six to fifteen years of having the disease they go from a relapse remitting phase where the inflammation is high to a secondary progressive phase where the inflammation is less but the disability begins to accumulate and unfortunately in this portion of the disease our treatment options are limited so you really want to try to get patients early in the rrms phase and then there's a third type of ms it's not as common as the primary progressive ms and for this type of uh, disease group, we only have one treatment available. What is the definition of an MS relapse? A relapse is any neurologic symptom that lasts more than 24 hours. And the, tw and the 24 hours is important because when I tell my patients, you know, we all get numbness, tingling. If you sit on the floor, your legs may, may go numb for a couple minutes. Or if you wake up sometimes and you sleep wrong, you may notice your hands are numb or you that may even be paralyzed. But the hallmark difference is it has to last 24 hours or more. If it's not 24 hours, it's not a relapse. What happens at a, on an imaging level? As you can see on, these, on this slide right here, you see the classical lesions of, M, of MS lesions. They are usually round to ovoid, three to five millimeters in size. They tend to be periventricular or juxtacortical. And with ad improvements in MRI technology, we're now able to see lesions in the cortex itself. And on T1 image, you can see these black holes. And these are the highest, and these are the lesions that have the highest likelihood of showing long-term disability. Speaking of disability, brain atrophy, with over the course of years to decade with a person having MS, with the destruction, with the degeneration, with the inflammation, you know, at the end of the day, people lose neurons, and this can lead to ultimate brain atrophy. As you can see on these two images, there's an, health, an image of a healthy normal brain, and there's an image of a brain of a person who has MS. And both age match controls. As you can see, the ventricles are enlarged in the 50-year-old patient with MS versus his 50-year-old controlled uh, age match peer. The gyri are deeper, the sulci are smaller. This is what happens if with MS if it goes untreated because a lot of the treatments do affect brain atrophy and do slow down the rate of brain atrophy. How do you diagnose MS? You need lesions disseminated in space and time, meaning you have to have two lesions in two different areas and cannot be explained by one common lesion. You also have to have paraclinical examinations to help aid your diagnosis, MRIs, lumbar puncture. If you don't have an abnormal MRI, you cannot be diagnosed with MS, okay? You also have to rule out any alternative diagnosis. And you know, I usually, if any patient who's suspected to have MS in my clinic, I will run a full autoimmune profile, ANA, ENA, double-stranded DNA. I'm looking for any vasculitides such as P anca or C anca. I'll look for a hypercoagulable state. Yes, it's a big net. Yes, some there's a lot of false negative there's a lot of false negatives tests or a lot of negative tests. But if you miss it or if you they have another etiology, the treatment changes. And like I say, if you don't look for the disease, you're not going to find it. Just this week I found I had an 85 year old lady who presents the clinic with uh, memory loss. She had tertiary syphilis. So if you're not looking for it, you're not gonna find it. What are the current treatments we have for MS? There are more than 15 drugs available right now that we have to treat MS, and the list keeps growing daily. And as you can see from this busy slide, each drug has a different mechanism of action. Some, some medications will trap, will trap lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. Some of them work more on the antioxidant level on the, lymph, on the lymphocytes. Some of them affect more of a mitochondrial level. Some of them affect more of a mitochondrial level. Some of them affect cell trafficking or diapedesis from the blood across the blood-brain barrier into the, into the CNS. And yet we now have another class of medications that affect B cells and B cell and B cell activities. And speaking of B cells, historically, MS used to be considered as the T cell mediated disease. 
But now we've recently known and more research has been showing that the B cells do play a role as well. And how does this work? You know, your immune system is not separate. B cells are always talking to T cells and your T cells are talking to B cells, right? And your B cells have a pro-inflammatory function and an anti-inflammatory function. So the medications that have been currently used to treat B cells, I kind of, st I started talking about ocrelizumab yesterday. This was the first FDA approved B cell mediated tra uh, treatment for MS. It works on CD20 B cell positive receptors. And, and, and in this, with a B cell disease or B cell treatments, what you're doing is if you look here, this is the lineage or the lifeline from stem cell to plasma cell. Most of the CD20 B cell depleting agents will not affect your stem cells, will not affect your plasma cells, but kind of affect everything in the middle. So what happens? What does this mean? Your humoral immunity is spared. That means your ability to fight off infections is still spared. Your, the immunity or the immune response that you have acquired from being younger, it's still spared. You do not lose that, which is important. When we talk about monoclonal antibodies, 10 years ago when I was a resident, we had one monoclonal antibody that we rarely used was rituximab. Right now in MS, we are right now we have four monoclonal antibodies, natalizumab, alamtuzumab, ofatumumab, ocrelizumab, and rituximab. Now we have five actually, not four. And monoclonal antibodies actually, they can be either mouse model, as you can see here. They can be humanized, meaning that they have mouse and human um, antibodies, or they can be fully human. And if you look at how do you tell the difference between the name between whether it's mouse, humanized, or human, look at the name. If the name has XI, that's purely mouse. If it has ZU, that's humanized. And if it has MU, that's human. So Z, Zu, Mu. I feel like I'm talking to my eight month old child right now. Well, that's the difference. Rituximab, ocrelizumab, and ofatumumab. So speaking of ocrelizumab, I spoke about it yesterday. This was the first CD20 cell depleting agent and it, that was approved for MS. And in the studies, the OPERA1 and OPERA2, OPERA2, this drug showed significant improvement, not only in relapse reduction, 46%. It also showed an improvement on disability progression, 40%. It basically shut down the brain activity with new and enlarging T2 lesions at 94% and 95% uh, respectively in the OPERA1 and OPERA2 trial. How safe was it? It's an extremely safe medicine. Well, the only thing that ocrelizumab, the, one of the main side effects was allerg uh, were infusion-mediated reactions because it is a humanized monoclonal antibody. Some patients do get uh, infusion-related reactions. I currently have around 33 to 34 patients in my clinic on ocrelizumab. Um, usually, the infusion-related re reactions are mild. They're not severe. Nothing more than a little bit of Benadryl cannot help. So today I'm going to talk to you about the Escalipius trial. This is the efficacy and safety of ofatumumab versus teraflunamide in relapsing remitting patients. This was a phase two uh, trial, and there were two. There was the Escalipius one and Escalipius two. Now, who was Escalipius? Escalipius is the Roman god of medicine. He used to walk around with a staff with a snake on it. And this caduceus, the, the staff for the snake, is still the symbol of medicine till this day. So in this trial, how was it designed? It was a double blind, double dummy trial, randomized placebo control. So what does that mean? You had two arms. You had one arm where patients were given teraflunamide, which is a medium, a medium efficacy disease modifying treatment. And the other arm, it was patients were given ofatumumab. Now in each arm, patients were given pill with placebo infusion, or they were given ofatumumab with placebo pill. And then they were monitored for the next two years. And now ofatumumab, it was given every month. It's a once a month infusion sub-Q. How did the medication work? How, was, how, how well did it work? As you can see in Escalipius 1 and Escalipius 2, you had a 50% reduction in annualized relapse rates in the first trial and the second trial. 
This is against active competitor. This is not against placebo. So the relapse rate, as you can see, the annualized relapse rate went from 0.22 in the teraflunamide group to 0.11. That's a 50% improvement, but that basically means you went from one relapse every five years to one relapse every 10 years. That's a good thing. How did it do with reduction in confirmed disability worsening? And the three month and the six month confirmed disability worsening, you had a 34.4% reduction in the three months and at the six months on worsening of disability. How did this drug do on confirmed disability improvement? You had a 35.2% chance of improving on, with, uh, on ofatubumab. It was not statistically significant, but if you remember yesterday when I was talking about the disability worsening, it is actually one of the most hardest parameters to follow because you need time to determine disability doesn't, the notice, to have a medication that improves, sometimes you need to see it over a course of years. And hopefully on the open label extension, these curves will separate further and we'll see a significant improvement, but the trend is already that it does show improvement. What about GAD enhancing lesions? It basically shuts down any active inflammation, any active disease. You have a 97.5% relative re risk reduction in the first trial and a 93.8% risk reduction in the second trial. Remember, this is against active competitor. That This is not against placebo. Basically, you have no new lesions, what you can say, on people who were treated with ofatumumab. What about new or enlarging T2 lesions? Again, you had an 82% reduction in new and enlarging T2 lesions in the first trial and 84.5% risk reduction in the second trial. Again, this is not against placebo. I keep saying this because the, the drug it's being compared to is a good medication. I currently have 20 patients on teraflunamide. And, you know, I have patients on the medication that have been stable for eight, not eight years, six years stable. So if they have a medication that offers even more benefit and even more reduction in disability, that's a pretty impressive finding on, on, on the study. What were the side effects? There were no major side effect differences between the teraflutamide group and the ofatumumab group, except for when you look at uh, in the teraflutamide group, there was an increased risk of alopecia, which is a common side effect in the teraflutamide. 14.7% of the patients had some hair thinning. It's usually mild. It's usually uh, returns three months, three to four months later, but the people in the ofatumumab group did not have it. There were no infusion-related reactions. There were no increased risk of infections. This was a relatively, this was and is a safe medication with no red flags, no warnings. So in summary and conclusion, in the Escalipius 1 and 2 studies in patients with relapsing remitting, remitting MS, it successfully demonstrated that ofatumumab versus teraflutamide had superior efficacy in not just lowering the rates of relapses, but also basically shutting down the immune response with new lesions in the brain. You had a significant reduction in the three months and six months confirmed disability worsening. You also had a trend toward disability improvement. It also lowered levels of neurofilament light chain. I didn't talk about neurofilament light chain, but this is a blood test which, with, which can be done, and it is a marker of axonal destruction. So having lower levels of neurofilament light chain means that you are basically preventing axonal destruction. And this was shown at month three and at all sub sub uh, subsequent visits that, uh, that the NFL levels were low. There was a safety, favorable safety profile and no unexpected safety signals. There was no imbalance between rates of infections or malignancies. Uh, so at the end of the day, ofatumumab, 20 milligrams sub-Q, demonstrated high efficacy and a favorable safety profile. Now, what, what can, if, I, if someone was gonna ask me from a, primary, from a primary care perspective, what would I need to know about this medication? First of all, I will tell you that you're probably, from a PCP, a primary care perspective, you're probably not gonna write ofatumumab or ocrelizumab or any of the other DMDs. But what you are gonna do is you will see patients 
with MS in your clinics. You will see patients with MS who are not on treatments, either because they've given up, they've lost hope, or maybe they were on medications and they slept due to side effects. Due to side effects. And I'm sorry. They, they may have suspected you had your speaker. Okay. They may have stopped due to side effects. And that is where the conversation starts. The conversation for treatment doesn't start with me. It starts with you, the primary care field. You are the first people, you are the front line who will see these patients. And if you see someone with MS who's not on treatment, please refer them to a center, to a neurologist who can see them and offer them medications that have been shown to help, shown to slow down progression, improve disability, and reduce brain atrophy. Thank you very much, and I am good on time. Dr. Jihad, you can turn on your mic right now. I can't hear you. You hear me now? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Yeah, okay. Very good. So thank you for this excellent presentation. We have a few questions. Okay. If we can ask. So the first question from Sahar Abdullah. Can we stop brain atrophy in the MS patients? Yes, actually. A lot of the medications have been shown to reduce brain atrophy and ofatumumab it has also been shown to slow down the rate of brain atrophy. Yes. Most people with, now we all normally have brain atrophy at a rate of 0.1 to 0.4% per year. But people with MS tend to have a higher rate of brain atrophy that which ranges from 0.4 to 1.5%. So if you put that in the scheme of 10 years, if you can lose 15% of your brain potentially if you have MS and it's aggressive. So yes, medications can slow down brain atrophy. But is there any DMD which has higher efficacy on a brain atrophy? We have 20 DMDs now. Which one is superior in delaying or slowing down the brain atrophy? That's a very good question. Uh, Ofatubumab has been shown to slow brain atrophy. Ocrelizumab has been shown to slow down brain atrophy. Uh, teraflutamide has a very good profile in slowing down brain atrophy. Uh, a lot of ones are. Those are, those are the three that come on the top of my head. Isabri, I think it does as well. And, um, and most of them do, but I mean, it varies now whether which one is better or worse, that we don't have any head-to-head -head trials ex saying that this drug slows it down better than this drug. Not yeah, but there mind. are many there were many studies uh, done on fingulomo gelinia in particular over the last ten years, and they uh, proven that it slows down the brain atrophy significantly. Good point. Thank I agree you. with what you have mentioned. There's another question from Ashik Kawusa. Can we diagnose MS if the lesion is limited to the eye and spinal cord? Okay. That's a very good question. According to the 2017 revised McDonald criteria, optic neuritis is not part of the diagnostic criteria for MS. So you would still need two lesions in two out of four areas, juxtacortical, periventricular, infratentorial, spinal cord, or cortical. You need two lesions in two out of those four areas, and you have that would satisfy the dissemination in space. You would also need either a new enhancing or non-enhancing lesion, or you need oligoclonal bands. So optic neuritis would not be part, even though it's a symptom and it's commonly affected, it's not part of the diagnostic criteria for MS. Yeah, you're absolutely right, but there was some uh, suggested to the, in the Magni MS to add the imaging of the optic nerve as one of the radiological diagnostic criteria, but I don't know, it was deleted. It was. You see, yeah, I don't know why, actually. Uh, they said they may introduce it again. And they may put the OCT as part of the criteria. There's one question here, many from Elena Azar. Many physicians just rule out MS by just having normal neurological assessment in the clinic, even in presence of alarming symptoms. What do you think about that? So, Thank you. So, as just to summarize, many physicians rule out MS by having a normal neurologic assessment in clinic, even in the presence of symptoms. So, here's the thing: you you need to use them both together. Now, if you have symptoms with a normal MRI, it's not MS. 
I mean, it has to be, you have to look for other etiologies. If you have an abnormal MRI with no symptoms, that's a hot topic of debate, and that's what we would call potentially RIS, uh, radiographically isolated <laughs> syndrome. Treat, not treat, that's still something that's being researched and debated, but you have to have MRI symptoms. You have to be able to explain the symptoms. So if the MRI is normal, it's not MS, and look for another etiology. That's what I would say. So it is clinical, supported by the relevant uh, investigations. Yes, uh, one, one question from me, Dr. Ahmad, you are the expert in this. Uh, during the COVID, there are some uh, the global MS registry initiated by the MS base. They found some correlation between CD20 debilitating agents and severity of uh, COVID. I will not yes. say morbidity or mortality, I say severity. Uh, do you have an explanation for this or any uh, ideas? Uh, that's a very good question. It's it's definitely a topic of hot debate. Why were patients on, anti on CD20 cell depleting agents showing an increased propensity of having a bad outcome? Uh, like I said now, we do know that people on CD20 cells do with time develop lower IgG immunoglobulin levels. So did that play a role? I'm not sure. Uh, could it be, even though your humoral immunity is intact, your plasma cells do decrease over time. Did that play a role? I'm not sure. I think we're going to need more, more time and more research to answer that question fully. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. I agree entirely with you. One uh, comment about the Ofatumab, that the uh, advantage on other uh, DMDs, it is uh, monthly injection, self-injection, subcutaneous injection. So a patient can do at home monoclonal therapy, which is fantastic. And mm -hmm. the second thing, you don't need monitoring, you don't need screening, you, do, you don't need blood testing every month and so on. So I expect some... Uh, uh, important addition in MS therapy from this uh, drug. It has been FDA approved in August, and I think a few weeks ago registered in the United Arab Emirates. We are waiting to find where it will be fitting in the MS treatments. Uh, for the sake of time, we finished our 30 minutes. So I will finish by thanking you very much, Dr. Ahmad, and Thank thanking you. Novartis for sponsoring, and thanking the attendee, the listeners for sending their questions. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Jihad. Always nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.